that is the panel discussion uh, which is uh, which should and will reflect all the discussions that we have had here today uh, or tonight and and here in our panel we have I'm chairing this panel uh, and we have Kirk who gave the uh, the keynote speak and then Myri who was um, who was there as well and Diane Hirschberg from University of Alaska Anchorage who has been uh, in charge of all uh, everything I would say Kirko Maxwell uh, from uh, UIT the Arctic University of Norway which is uh, uh, I think that record is located in Tromsø and uh, he was chairing the second breakout room and Diane uh, Myri was chairing the first number one breakout room and then we have Arja Rautio uh, who gave the opening words for the for the uh, for our con conference and to open the discussion I would first like to ask the um, uh, breakout chairs what uh, what were you talking in your in your breakout room so what were the main points you would like to bring us here for the for the discussion and maybe number one Mari can get started okay so I hope I reflect the conversations that we were having um in our our uh in our breakout session I think there's, there's probably two topics that we looked at one was around um language indigenous and minority languages um, and we were given a very challenging question from Sai about um, whether we can use them almost as a positive political force, um, but also how we can embed them within sort of national structures of educational policy so that we honour them and almost expand them. And the other topic that we looked at um, was digital education and we were thinking about the impact that COVID's had on um, you know that sudden move from face to face for many of us to online and what elements of that either blended or online we can take forward to improve um, educational provision in the north that it, perhaps it meets some of the needs around rurality. It perhaps mm. welcomes some of the community into what I call the black box of education, um, because when the learning was going on at home, um, we had to invite the community and particularly families into the learning space. Um, I think those were the two main topics that we discussed. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mari and uh, and how about Gregor? We were in the same session, but maybe you can, Gregor, uh, uh, say a few words about our session. Um, yeah, I will. I will try to reflect what we what we um, covered in the discussion. Um, there were a couple of of quite prevalent themes, which I think go across across contexts, um, and. The first one was discussed in the context of the study that um, Anna Meta is presenting and the, the dilemma of how to deliver um, inclusive and effective and, uh, and, and, and um, pedagogically appropriate education in contexts where there's a very small number and by virtue of that, the, the schools are very multi-aged. Um, so, 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 so there's no there's no clear traditional distinction in terms of um, the grades that the um, pupils are divided into, um, and that I, I I felt is something that a number of us are grappling with. Not just not just the um, context from the north of Norway uh, that Anna Meta was was talking about. We also had 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 um, input from from Canada, and I'm sure. I'm sure that rings true to many other places as well. Um, we also touched on um, uh, themes such as um, being culturally responsive, both both in your uh, curriculum, but also in your assessment. And the, 
there was quite a lot uh, discussed around um, the presentation from Greenland um, in terms of that there's there's still yes the local culture is now 90 plus percent Greenlandic but it's based on a system that's very much based on non um, indigenous non locally um, produced mm. uh, um, material and teacher training and such so how that how, how that is developing how that the um, yeah, effectively a, a, a sort of post-colonial hangover is, is is still present, and that 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 certainly rings true in a number of contexts. I'm sure. Thank you very much, Maria and Gregor. And uh, then I turn to our panel and um, uh, and ask uh, ask how do you do you see the equity and um, education, equity and inclusion, teaching and learning for sustainable north, what are the key challenges and but also not only the challenges but the key answers uh, to this to these um, questions we are having or the issues we are handling here in the north and I might first go to Arya please. So thank you very much, uh, Tuija. So that this has been really interesting, interesting to listen and and, and also thinking the, the what kind of things there are somehow behind or common or or something which is in the society at the same time. I was um, I was thinking that one of the very important issues is just happening now. So that people are telling the situation, they are telling the best practices, they are they are having through those solutions they, they have made. And um, those presentations which I was listening, I was, um, I was thinking about these um, multi-languages so that they are from different, uh, mm. different um, cultures and uh, how, how, to, how to manage to do or, or as, um, just were saying that it uh, effective, effective uh, or, or work, working and having a good result so that that uh, when all these aspects are, the people are, pupils are from different age, they are somehow very small group as such. And then all, all these different different things together. So that um, I, I think that the, the way having, having this kind of uh, seminars and conferences and workshops through those things, uh, and actually, I was thinking that also this corona situation and digital, digitalization and, and all the, perhaps the, it is a possible to probe the, the different the structures which has been very long time and perhaps they are not anymore working so well. And I think that in this time is, is really important to, to have the discussion. And so that, uh, and finding the perhaps uh, different types of the solutions, but, but uh, uh, in, in different regions and, and, and different different types of the schools and and, uh, and also the teacher education. I was um, in one uh, in a occasion that uh, <clears throat> I, I'm involved in a research project where we are uh, in different regions in the Arctic and uh, we are also talking uh, with the schools uh, with the teachers and then also some introducing our research topic to the pupils and um, in that uh, case, I was just thinking that uh, how much it is used that the elders in the indigenous communities are also coming to the school and how, how it is uh, nowadays when we have this community coronavirus situation. So that um, this type of the ideas where they're coming, but I think that the collaboration and sharing the information and knowledge is, is somehow really important. Uh, so thank you. Thank you, Arya. Uh, how about Diane? You, what do you think uh, about these uh, um, themes of the conference after listening to presentations and and the keynote? I think I, I, in our small group, as we talked across these issues of equity of um, language and identity, and then. Um, distance, we were talking about some of the challenges um, 
that we've seen emerge. And also the idea that we need to keep those in mind as we look to not going back to what was once we are, are through this pandemic, but thinking about um, how we move forward in what we've learned. But listening to Aria, the other piece I think is so important is always to remember that education is not the same thing as schooling. That mm. schooling is one piece of learning and the transfer of knowledge. And then the things that happen on the land, the things that happen in your um, dining room conversation while talking to your, your mother or grandmother while she cooks, all of those things um, are so important and how do we not lose the, the, the traditional land-based, um, culture-based ways of sharing knowledge that have been in place for thousands and thousands of years while taking advantage of new technology because what scares me is we could use um, distance learning and technology as a different weapon in maintaining a uh, colonized system. Mm -hmm. And I would say, at least in Alaska, that's a huge threat that we, we have. Um, uh, we have somebody who, who is an educator by training, who is our, our governor, who would like nothing more than to force people into only a uh, kind of religious-based and or voucher-based and or homeschool-based kind of system and um, really is, is, is threatening the very existence of a public education system that can in some cases bring some equity in places that, that otherwise don't have that. Um, at the same time, this is the person who's talking about tribal compacting and allowing tribes to run schools. And even if his motivation is simply to save money, that could result in something profoundly different and better for large parts of our state if we do it right, if our motivations as the educators are right. So, so all of these things have sort of been bubbling up as, as I've been listening to these conversations, and I'm hoping maybe others have thoughts to help us um, make some sense of this. Mm. Thank you, Diane. That was very important notion that even though the digitalization uh, provides us means to overcome the long distances, it also has the other side of the sword, if, uh, if I would like to say so. There's also, that's the way to um, provide one size education uh, which will fit for all and we know that that is not the case and also the idea that education does not uh, happen only in school or it might even happen not happen at all at schools or it, it might happen outside of school and important things to learn learn is actually might happen outside of school for elders and from community cooperation for example. Um, Mm, thank you, Diane. And then Kirk, please, could you reflect your ideas of today's conference? Or con yes. Thanks, Toya, <clears throat> and everyone else too. It's really been an interesting discussion. Um, I, I have to coach everything I say in, in the sense that uh, climate change and plastics are an existential threat to all of us. And I, and I think we have to bring that more into our conversations, whether it's on the agenda or not, because the agenda is coming to us. And I get to that these systems that produce these products and these results are systematic efforts by mostly pretty good people who've been through our school systems, who uh, want good for the world, who talk about progress. In the indigenous context and in the non-indigenous context and northern context and southern context, it is always about a better world. You know, it's never I want to go out and and and, and destroy this person's lifestyle. I might want them to change. You know, I want them to have a better life. Um, so when we when we get specific to what we're talking about today, I, I come back to systems thinking and how if we can get enough people working uh, in an open and collaborative fashion and enable self-governance and local control for the right people and give them the right levers, good things will happen. Our schools are good at what they do. Our public schools do good work. 
it, I mean, are they, they're effective, I should say. But how can they be more effective in doing more of the right things? And, and I, I, I like Blair's uh, study a little bit in, in a sense that he talked about outdoors, that the iPad was not connecting them to the internet so that he can be connected to more mainstream Southern ideas. It was simply a, as a, almost like a scientific journal to make them scientists in their own community, which is what we want from our students. Really. So, so we need to take our systems and make them work for the right reasons the right way, which we always say we do. So, so recognize the existential threat that we're facing uh, in terms of climate change and, and plastic. Uh, let's see how we can enable indigenous peoples and our own and, and non-indigenous peoples to go forward in a way that makes it, gives us a healthy planet and, and healthy communities. So systems, I'll, I'll go back to that. The, the reason I, I, I like to focus on assessment it's all too often assessment is about, um, it's, it's much like the profit idea, that my company is doing a good job if it makes good money for my shareholders. Uh, whereas opposed to what some businesses are saying, now they have to measure social good. They have to measure uh, the economics of social justice. You know, and so it, it's coming. Um, we have to nurture that in every way we can. So the solutions for indigenous peoples are the solution for the planet. So. Uh, there I go. <laughs> that's all I'll say. Yeah. Yes. That's a that's actually quite big message, Kirk. And and also, if we think about education, um, we are education for the future. So the world which is coming in two thousand and fifty to two thousand one hundred. So the young people, children who are now in the education or even the higher education, they are living in the world which might be very different from what we know. And we have to equip them to, um, first of all, to fix all the problems we have, <laughs> we have gave them, and then the uh, living in an environment which is probably it is very different, and finding the solutions for the best of the whole planet. And so that is the we can't we can't differ ourselves from the what is happening in in our planet. Thank you, Kirk. And then in chat box, uh, Abhishek Pandey asks that how to fill gap of digital divide among the rural and urban students, how to deliver content to rural students who do not have internet access. This is very important question and Mitlara, no, it was um, uh, not Mitlara, but who was in our first group two was talking about us using iPads, iPads uh, without the internet connection. That was that was Lars. But Lars. Right, the context is Greenland. Yes, yes. Um, Lars, I think that he he had to. Yes, I yeah, think that I he think had to. He has that he has left. Yes, yes. But any mm. thoughts from our panel panelists? What do you think that? how we then use the digitalization without the internet access. So any, uh, if you would rise, rise your hand or just uh, open your mic panel. Yes, Dan, please. Well, I will share. I was part of a project from the Anchorage Museum where we've been crea creating um, materials that um, educators can use, whether it is, um, historic materials or using art and, and other um, pieces of the collection, including the Smithsonian Collection on Arctic Studies. And one thing they did was they create, put all the materials onto a small um, thumb drive um, so that they could just mail to teachers all the material without them needing to download it. Because even though all of our schools have some connection to the internet in order to download, um, especially graphic heavy files, it just takes ridiculous amounts of time. So let's not do that. Let's um, give them, you know, that they, the amazing way that we can put large amounts of information on very small drives that be, can be connected through a USB port. It really has changed, um, but we just have to think creatively about that. So thank goodness our museum did. Um, 
and and then I think along with Lars is where people can take portable technology out into the field and capture the information and then at three in the morning when nobody else in your community is on the internet that might be when you upload things or download things um there's a little bit of that that happens as well okay thank you diane uh, any other comments from the panelists please what are your thoughts about uh, how to how to uh, feel captive of the digital divide among the rural and urban students Hi, uh, Toya. This is Kirk. Uh, yeah. If I, if I can, uh, one of the things that I, I, I do when I, when I think about this is I think sometimes we're guilty of weak teaching when we want, uh, we want internet in a way that uh, does work with students. So, you know, you used to have an encyclopedia in your house if you were lucky or maybe your neighbor had one. Now you go to the internet and, and, and you do research. And there's some really good learning to be done there. There really is. But um, I worry about that uh, when I go to a rural schools or even uh, urban schools, when there's a whole outdoors there, there's an ocean, there's birds, there's trees, there, you know, uh, if you think about biology, now you can't have in a large city, all your children outside tearing the birds apart. You know, it's just not, it wouldn't, wouldn't be pretty, right? but, uh, but there are many places where you could do that. So, so over dependence and over reliance and over, we may overstate the, uh, the case for technology or for internet to the detriment of, of land-based and, and local learning. So mm. I think we need to balance that out and we need to, because uh, because objectives or outcomes, uh, they can be, they can, they can, you can lead people to them with, with several mechanisms. And so uh, Diane was talking about you know, some adaptations that I think are, are quite good. And, and, and that's where we need to think, but we keep thinking if we can put broad-based internet in every Northern community across the globe, problems are going to go away. Well, they won't. Uh, you know, you're going to have internet problems with people up at 3 in the morning playing video games. It's, uh, <laughs> uh, but it, it, it's how we create that, uh, that system that supports learning and supports sustainability within those communities as they exist. So, and this forum is, is a really good example of that, where we have technology and we have largely a, a pan-global uh, Arctic-centric community discussing issues of the North. That would not happen if, if uh, if we didn't have this medium to use in that way. So, yeah, mm. good, thanks. Yes, up and, yes, yes. And uh, I think that you had a question or comment. Did I see correct? You did. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Uh, but now we can't, so open your mic, please. Okay. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, perfect, sorry. Um, I'm just going to build a little bit on Kirk and give a maybe just a small bit of uh, information that's come up. Um, I guess everyone's come to understand about Canada's north. Uh, currently, right now, there is uh, quite a few people in northern Canada that, that do not have internet, and the Canadian government has is trying to uh, is going to fund um, more northern communities for the use of internet. We, Kirk and I, uh, know one teacher who is actually she's an outside. Well, she teaches. Uh, culturally responsive pedagogies through outdoor environment education uh, and she has a tundra school and she shared with me currently right now because of lockdown they are not going ahead with schooling uh, and the suggestion to her was that they could actually offer her programming through um, a digital capacity uh, to her which was quite disturbing um, obviously because she sees that teaching is about the land um, and one of the things that I've always enjoyed about this teacher's um, teaching and her pedagogies is the way in which she has used technology as just being a source to share information or for children to be able to lay witness, as she says, to the land, either through you know, looking at plants or, you know, finding out more information um, or sharing experiences. So I really like what Kirk shared there is that we really need to understand that the land should be the first teacher and that the teacher to be able to use digital media as part of that, uh, to be able to convey learning, but also to extend that knowledge. So I just wanted to share that. So hopefully in the coming months, we'll be able to share a little bit more about what changes there are in Canada uh, with the new infusion of Canadian money, quite a bit of money into the North. But as she shared with me as well, she told me that within 
a week and a half, she and her husband, since they went to online schooling, and he's a nurse practitioner, so he's offering medical uh, through online means that they managed to burn through their internet, which is, is quite a large cost to them. <laughs> so there's these other equity issues that we have to think about. Thank you. Yeah, sure, sure, yes. And I just want to share, because I'm chairing this session, I have this privilege to use, <laughs> use my... Um, my address is so uh, I know one teacher who used this digital means to explore the uh, scientific issues like for example the shape of the water drop and they didn't need the internet access to that what they did is actually uh, he and his classroom he, they took a video of the water drop and then they uh, slowed it very slowly to uh, screen by screen so to to explore what is the size uh, and, and the form of the water, water drop. So, and I think that that also goes with snow. snow. All snowflakes are different. So we can use these digital means also uh, without uh, internet access to provide us new ways of understanding the reality around us. Um, but then we have a question from Timo, in the chat box, do you think you could use cultural legends to sust support sustainable in the pers perspective of Agenda 2030 goals connected to science education? I think that you are referring to United Nations Agenda 2030 and teacher education using maybe using cultural sensitive methods like sustainable Santa in responsible education. So what do you think about Santa and sustainable education, our panelists, I would ask first, what about you, Arya? What do you think about the combination of sustainability and Santa Claus? Oh, this, this was a question which came so quickly. <laughs> 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 so that <clears throat> perhaps I, I, I was just uh, in, in, a, in a topic which we just already discussed, so that about the connectivity and other things, so I'm... I'm now I, I say answer to that, so that you know that I'm changing a little bit. So that uh, <clears throat> we have also the thematic network of the telecommunication, and they try to have the connections in the in the Arctic regions and, and find the solutions. And so that uh, that's also they they somehow want to help and 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 have the cases and and the places and and how how to do the things if the connectivity is is uh, wanted to have to 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 arrange and so and i i think that that is a that is an issue and and um, about the telecommunication or this digitalization uh, issue so that um, i'm a medical doctor in my training and and so that um, we have been thinking when i was uh, studying medicine we were thinking that we need uh, uh, it, telemedicine is wonderful and of course uh, now I have been talking with those uh, colleagues in the Nordic countries which has a long distance and they have very small hospital or or healthcare center and they were thinking that okay it's when you have broken arm or something like that that would be useful but it has been the most useful in the in the mental wellness and mental health issues those consultations and other things so that uh, when we have the new type of the uh, technology or, or other types of the things, we, we cannot see first what is the what is the their place in the in the big picture, and and sometimes it, it takes uh, upside down uh, issues that uh, and I remember also I was thinking that perhaps that is not uh, working not at all in, in that but it has been it has been in, in those days case is the most most important tool when you don't have the services in the north. But the Santa and um, that um, perhaps someone else can, <laughs> could answer a little bit for that. So thank you. Thank you. So Mairi, I turn to you. So what do you think about Santa and sustainability? Uh, yes, please. Well, I'm all for Santa. Um, I, I'm also like Arya, I'm going to go back a little bit. Um, but I will come to Santa. Um, I, I think that sometimes the distinction between rural and urban uh, digital poverty, uh, either to do with devices or to do with um, internet connection, I think it's broader than that. Um, I know that 
we had a huge problem with our students when lockdown happened because of COVID, because we realized that at least 30% of our, our higher education students didn't actually, when they went home, have access to either a laptop or the internet because of the families they came from, sort of fifth, sixth generation Indian families living in, the, in inner cities. Um, and so one of the things we had to do was we had to make sure that all the teaching we were doing could be seen on a mobile phone. Um, so I think a lot of the conversation that we've had has been about refiguring what a teacher is. And I think this is underpinning a lot of the conversations we've had tonight to rethink what education actually means and what a teacher's job is. Because I think if we think traditionally about a teacher, maybe from an Anglo-centric point of view, it's that idea of delivering. So if we think about digital education, if we just think about it delivering learning, it's just not going to meet anybody's needs. And I think we've got to start thinking about teachers as facilitators of learning rather than deliverers of education. And then they're making choices about whether digital means or sustainable Santa. And I will admit, I don't know much about sustainable Santa, but it, that might well be something that teachers can use to facilitate learning. And I think it's about changing our mindset to new ways of learning. And as Diane says, not thinking of schools as learning or education. So but I admit I haven't heard about sustainable Santa, but I am going to look him up. Okay. Yes. Thank you. And Gregor, what do you think about sustainability and Santa Claus Christmas? I'm 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 more more than sure that um, Santa comes from the North Pole and has not, nothing mm. to do with Lovaniemi. Oh, oh, we don't go to that discussion. No, 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 no. <laughs> um, no, but sorry, back onto a, a serious track. Um, I too haven't haven't really heard of this uh, sustainable Santa. Um, I, uh, idea before, so I need to do a little bit of background reading there too. Um, but I think it sounds like a like a useful um, a useful metaphor, perhaps, to to um, to uh, to bring things forward. Um, <clears throat> continuing, um, I have some thoughts on on the um, sort of technology poverty um, debate here. Um, it really depends on your political uh, will and intentions because examples we have in Norway, um, the po it, there was political will to prioritize rural areas in terms of connecting up the latest wave of um, fiber optic high speed internet here. Now, I'm not saying they hit everywhere, all the remote islands first, but there was certainly political will to prioritize rural areas over the large urban areas. Um, and an example I can give locally here in Tromsø is that the large town of Tromsø was the last place to be connected to the large fiber optic internet network that is, has been rolled out in the last two or three years. So there can be political solutions um, <clears throat> there as well. But that's, that's, that I'm aware that that's coming from a relatively privileged and uh, wealthy country. But anyway, um, so just a bit of perspective from, from that point of view, at least. Mm -hmm. um, I, see, I see now I, I have sparked a whole debate about Santa in the chat box, but I, I think yeah. we should just leave okay. it there. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but I will not. I will come back to this, Santa, because yes, I understand the question from Timo about the sustainable uh, Santa Claus. I am from Rovaniemi, and because I'm chairing this session, I can say that, Rova that Santa Claus lives in Rovaniemi, okay, because uh, we are living just next to him. Mm -hmm. Okay, but uh, here in Rovaniemi, Santa Claus uh, has a bigger message than just just uh, uh, providing more consu consuming, consuming, so consuming. And Santa, he gives speech every year. And in that speech, he, he talks about friendship. She to he talks about um, taking care of each other. He talks about uh, looking after each other. And 
he doesn't talk about uh, giving gifts or giving material and giving so on. So in that sense, from the real Santa Claus perspective, the message from Santa Claus is uh, much bigger than just giving gifts. And I, I have been, I have had a discussions with my Australian friends. How do you know who is a real Santa? And and here in Rovaniemi, we know who is real Santa on the way how is uh, he speaking and how he's actually delivering the message of caring the whole 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 world and the uh, and looking after each other yeah but now we leave santa and there was uh, i think that we have time for one more question and that was about um uh design justice which came from Rhonda, and she asked that there is a term called design justice that i recently learned about it's all about designing learning through the lens of most, most marginal, march, marginalized, something like that. Critical digital pedagogy is also touches on this point. So design justice or designing justice. And uh, with this, I also give the final word to panelists and we started Diane. So what do you think about of designing justice, which is actually a really interesting concept. Yeah, it is. And I'm really glad Rhonda shared that because I have been looking with some colleagues at also topics of climate justice. And that's a big discussion because we know that quite often the communities that are facing the greatest harm from environmental and climate threats are also those that um, are marginalized thanks to the impact of the colonial project and and um, growing inequities in our communities. And so I really, I, I first of all, I think the word justice moving that to the for to the forefront and getting people to really think about how to um, build your learning opportunities around that um, is so important. And um, and I also, as she mentioned, critical digital pedagogies. We've actually had some workshops because we want our students to be able to be critical consumers of this new electronic world that, you know, we've all probably had the frustration that somebody has used a Google search and cited materials that we know are not um, really good, <laughs> reliable materials, we are now seeing that as a matter of course for the for the arguments over health in, in certainly this nation and in many others. So I think we have to be far more enabling of our of the critical lenses and skills of our young people. Um, and to also embrace that what we are trying to do is give people the tools so that they can enact their vision of sustainability. I'm going to tie it back to the earlier conversations because um, for me, there is no purpose to talking about sustainable development and sustainability if we aren't also enabling communities to determine what that is and how you get there. And how you get there means skills, skills from the knowledge of the elders, skills from legal studies at the university. It's, it's a mix of things, things that, that um, build the capacity for communities to enact their own visions. And I think that also then goes back to that, that idea of justice. Mm. Thank you, Diane. Uh, how about you, Kirk? What do you think about uh, designing justice? I, again, uh, the term is not unfamiliar, but it's the first time I've heard the term. <laughs> the, uh, uh, it's, one of the things that happens in academia is, is uh, to add nuance to our arguments or discussions. We, 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 we're very creative with our terms. And I don't know if this is a whole uh, uh, area of study or, or just a nuanced way of discussing something we're all familiar with. So uh, I'm all for that. It, it, you know, design justice, if you're talking about creating a critical learner who actually wants a better world, you know, it's, uh, and I get back to, you know, <laughs> 
<laughs> no world, no, <laughs> nothing's better. The, uh, uh, David Suzuki, well, it was at a pre I was at a presentation of his once. He's an environmentalist in Canada, for those who don't know. And uh, one of the uh, uh, folks lamented some of the things he was saying, saying, you know, my God, we're, we're going to destroy the planet. And, and uh, he said, no, no, he said, he said, the planet will survive humanity. The discussion he's having is whether humanity will survive its own actions. The mm -hmm. planet will recover. Mm -hmm. And so here we are now, seven plus billion people. And, and, and we're talking about education systems within a context that we're making the place we need to live sick. Mm -hmm. um, so where does education get there? One of my frustrations as, as president of the Canadian Dean's Association was I wanted a Dean's Accord on environmentally sustainable education. I was active with that group for four years and we never could quite get there. We haggled, we, it's like the UN, we haggled, we wrestled with it, you know, and all the time the, uh, the plastic bottles are floating around. So it's a, um, so I, I worry about our capacity to do that. I, I know systematically we do some really interesting things. So once we put our systems in place and they actually move in a, in, in, in a, in a direction, we can get there. You know, no one planned to have so much plastic in the world. That was not a plan. It's a result of other actions. Right? Mm -hmm. So, but how do we plan our way out of it? So how do we get our education systems to where we're, we're thinking about the planet in a way that we need to give it a chance to come back because our children's futures are part of that. And, um, I go back to David Suzuki once. He's 80 years old now. He held his twins, twin uh, grandchildren in his arms and uh, he broke down and started crying. And, and this is what he said. He said, I worry about the world we've left for them to live in. Mm -hmm. So we have to educate our children to deal and disentangle the world that we've created uh, systematically, but unintentionally. Mm -hmm. uh, one last thing, again, I'm, I'm all about, uh, I was optimistic about that big oil was getting the message that sustainable fuels, electric cars, blah, blah, blah. Still worried about plastics, right? But a recent uh, uh, media release or, or, or study at CBC, uh, CBC, Canadian Broadcasting Company, big oil's plan is to move away from fossil fuels for cars, but to increase plastic production to replace mm -hmm. their markets. And what they want is to re, uh, re, recycle 100% of their plastic but take whatever oil they can find and turn that into more plastic. Mm. This is insane. Yeah. Okay. yeah. And, yes. and we're educating the people who goes in, go into those systems. So mm. governance matters. Government needs to take leadership. Our school systems are absolutely important in creating a, a population that, that sees the world in a, in a way we need it. And the thing about the indi indigenous peoples and the North is, is our rootedness to uh, the earth as something that nurtures us is actually part of the healing message that we need to take back to the South and to non-Indigenous mm -hmm. people as well. Mm -hmm. now, and that does exist within non-Indigenous peoples. It's just, it's lost within the modernity project or the colonial project as Diane just described it. Yeah. So, uh, so thank you, thank you, Kirk. And just, uh, yes, uh, I know you can go on with that, but just a, a quick final words from Gregor and Myri and Arya. So Gregor first, please. Um, <clears throat> I'd, I'd just like to um, emphasize what um, Kirk's been banging on about with the uh, sustainability um, for, for the planet ahead of us. Um, the, the whole system that we build up needs to be sustainable from the get-go. Um, and, and yet there's some, some, some big challenges ahead, um, but I don't think they're impossible to overcome. And I look forward to being part of it. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And Myri, please. Uh, I guess I want to end on a positive note. Um, knowing young people, I think that I have faith in our young people to change the direction that the tanker is heading in towards destroying the planet. I, I can think of my own niece um, and nephew. So I have I have faith in young people, and maybe that's why we need. I, I like this idea of of. Did, um, design justice. Maybe if we take Michael Fielding's ideas of radical collegiality with our young people and allow them more decision-making within our education systems, that might be one way um, to change them for the better. Yes, thank you. And then Arya, please. So thank you. Um, I think that um, it would be so 
so marvelous that uh, it could be we all could um, have an impact that uh, young uh, people, children, they, they could find their own way with the sustainable solutions in, a, in a, this huge world which is now have uh, so many different uh, challenges and, and stressors. So that, but I think that uh, all these issues, they are supporting and, and, and um, having the light to, to go into the right direction. So I, I, I really trust that we can save the planet. Okay, thank you for the panelists. And I think that we can also join, everybody can join to applause the channel. The panelists, thank you. And now it's uh, my pleasure to turn to Diane to just uh, summarize and finalize this, this uh, online conference. I don't know that I can summarize it easily other than that it does give me great hope to be working with this group of, of people and our extended network. I hope any of you who have joined in here who have not been part of our thematic network before, we definitely welcome the participation of many, whether or not your university is signed on, we'd like to have you involved. Um, and, and so please reach out and, and we, we keep you involved. Um, just a little bit of what's coming up. We will be having a similar conversation at the Arctic Science Summit week. And um, there's a call for proposals. If any of you have work you're doing related to this, please consider putting in your abstract to join us at our session there. And you can uh, find if you just search for Arctic Science Summit week 21 or ASSW 21, you will find that call. and. We are the only education session, so you'll, you'll be able to find us quite easily. And um, we are looking to, um, our, our, this book that, that is what we built this around will be coming out. Well, we don't know when the final publishing will be, but certainly sometime next summer, we should have all our drafts done and um, uh, hopefully see it and, and have a launch and invite you all to join us again sooner than later for that. Okay. And with that, thank you all so much. Um, Yaneta has put a link. Um, we will also just note, uh, post the uh, Kirk's talk and this plenary conversation. And once I learn how to make the recording um, available and edit uh, out all the other stuff. So um, thank you again for participating and we look forward to seeing you soon.